time. I'm thrilled to be here. I'd like to thank the conference organising committee and the um, conference scientific committee, both of which uh, Professor Henry is on. And I would like to thank her very personally for uh, long standing and very fruitful collaborations. And I just love to please see, and I was just saying to Matt Shipton, who you'll be hearing from later, who's a colleague of mine from England, that to be in a country where the government and the public and apparently the taxpayers believe in humanistic education for its own sake and in growing it, coming from where in our country the exact opposite is true, is really just very good for the soul. So thank you. So I'm going to talk about the eagle. The eagle. The eagle which Zeus sent to torture Prometheus on the Caucasus has held an honoured place in the cultural imagination since ancient times. Thanks to Matt Shipton, mountaineer, I know that other mountaineers speak of a rocky outcrop high on Dick Tau that looks like a huge bird of prey. And legends still circulate about sightings of a mystery eagle in connection with mountaineers who never return. The fame of the Prometheus myth as an allegory for the persecution of humanists and heroes of labour has taken artistic representations of the Titan's torture by the Caucasian eagle across the world. This is a Georgian symbol that is truly everywhere recognisable, even by people who don't associate it with Caucasus. Completely at random is Prometheus in Uruguay. Now I'm just going to trace some different manifestations of the Caucasian eagle in both ancient and more recent literature and art. And I'm very pleased to say that your eagle, your Georgian eagle, even makes it to the stars. It's a cosmic symbol. Now the ancient had several different origin stories for Zeus's own eagle. One held that he was originally a primeval, virtuous Athenian named Periphas. And his rule was so admired that people began to honour him like a god, which angered Zeus. And Zeus was about to smite him with a thunderbolt, but Apollo intervened and transformed Periphas into an eagle and his wife into a vulture at the request of Apollo. This is, of course, the conference's own symbol, Spartan depiction. Look at the eagle carefully, but we'll be comparing it again shortly. Other narratives say that Zeus first adopted the eagle as his symbol during the war against the Titans, when he was sacrificing to Uranus to ask for help against the Titan brothers of Cronus. He saw an eagle fly nearby as a favourable omen for victory. So after the victory, he put a golden eagle on his war standards and dedicated it as a protection for his valour. Oh, sorry, not quite right. I'll get that. Oh dear, I'm going backwards, forwards, instead of backwards, please bear with me. I don't know why it's wobbling so much. After the victory, he put the gold eagle on his war stanzas and dedicated it as a protection for his valour. And astronomical literature also elaborates on this tradition, as we shall see, claiming that after Zeus was brought up in secret in Delos, the constellation Aquila originated when he sighted an eagle as he was sacrificing. But there's another story about that. A fascinating third alternative tradition, to which we shall return at the end of the paper, claimed that the eagle was a kind of mechanical robot, an automaton made by Hephaestus and only given organic life by Zeus himself. And I think that the tradition is echoed in this uh, extraordinary metal sculpture of Zeus's eagle in Hungary. Now, besides the myth of Prometheus and numerous omens sent by Zeus in Greek mythology and literature, 
The stories which Zeus is eagle are most often associated with are those of Ganymede, Hebe, and Psyche. And I'm not going to talk much about those because this is not the Caucasian eagle, except sometimes it is. Zeus's own resident eagle, resident on Mount Olympus, and the Caucasian eagle he sent against Prometheus were sometimes confused in ancient sources. And I actually think this may have been caused partly by the lack of definite and indefinite articles in archaic epic Greek. I don't think you have many definite articles either, do you? No. <laughs> in this theogony, Hesiod doesn't use an article of the eagle because he's writing epic hexameters, merely saying that Zeus aroused against the bound to Titan long-winged bird, not the long-winged bird, not a long-winged bird, just long-winged bird. I hoi et I eton or said am teron. And that was killed by Heracles. So, also in Hesiod, no geographical location is specified. It's not actually in this very famous image uh, of Prometheus on the rock. It's not in Hesiod's day, Caucasian. But you can see that the Laconian painters had a real eagle tradition. They didn't see any great difference between Zeus's eagle and the Caucasian eagle. In the East Galean Prometheus <laughs> band, though, the eagle that's predicted to attack Prometheus when he returns to the upper air, the prediction at the end of the play, which is set in Scythia, but he's going to go underground and then come back up in the Caucasus. We hear that when Prometheus does return to the upper air, his persecutor will be the winged hand of Zeus, the ravening eagle, the ostoid eternos on darfoyamus aetos. And in Prometheus Unbound, the speech which Prometheus made to the chorus of Titans, what a play that must have been, the whole chorus of Titans on the Caucasus. They arrived after a long journey which has included the River Phasis, Rioni. And we do have the Latin version of that speech by Prometheus by Cicero. And Prometheus said, and now, each woeful day, with dreadful swoop, the minister of Zeus with his hooked towels tears me apart by his cruel feasting, crammed and got into the full on my fat liver. It utters a prodigious scream, and soaring aloft with winged tail falls on my gore. But when my gnawed liver swells, renewed in growth, he greedily returns anew to his horrible meal. And this, my most ancient, miserable agony, intensified by the dreadful centuries, is passed from my body, from which their fall, melted by the blazing sun, drops that unceasingly pour on the rocks of Caucasus. But Apollodorus was very confused, since he gives the Prometheus eagle no article, I mean, absolutely have definite articles, and he doesn't even say that Heracles shot the eagle, just that he freed Prometheus. And that's because I think he's avoiding the problem that if the Caucasian eagle had been killed by Heracles, it couldn't have been the identical bird as the eternal emissary of Zeus. And other mythographers seem confused as well, and they realised this, and they, they gave the Prometheus eagle, which is not immortal, an independent genealogy now as the offspring of the monstrous Typhon and Echidna. And Zeus's eagle, I think, probably became associated with the Caucasus, often the far eastern boundary of Greek imaginary cartography, because the eagle was the only bird which flies straight into the rising sun. So this is the eastern edge of the world for the Greeks. And it's likely that it was the historiographer Ferricides of Leros, who around the turn of the fifth century before Aeschylus, disseminated a version of Prometheus' story located in the Caucasus, and it's also likely that that had been created by the Milesian Greek colonists of Phasis and Dioscorias, which were close under the western end of the Caucasus range. <clears throat> now, I'm very pleased with this, because this conference is called Perception of Caucasus, 
and I believe this is the only actual personification of Caucasus in ancient art. This is the uh, best I could do. It's a, it's a, a sarcophagus in Rome. Um, but this drawing does at least show you Heracles liberating Prometheus with the eagle, and the little guy in the top corner is a personification of Caucasus. So maybe we could get a better image of that to go in the book. And at the time of Alexander's campaign, I know other people are talking about this, an alternative location of Caucasus in the Hindu Kush began to be suggested as the Greeks went ever further east. But the mountains to the east of the Black Sea remained the majority view. Apollonius of Rhodes makes the Argonauts on approaching Colchis hear the groans of Prometheus and see the eagle going to and fro from its meal. In his Pericles of the Euxine Sea, Arian mentioned a summit in the Caucasus named Strobilos, which is twisted like a pine cone. Um, and he says that that he saw as he returned from Astolfos towards Dioscorias, and we saw the mountain range. And one peak of the Caucasus was pointed out, the name of the peak was Strobilos, he says, where according to the story, Prometheus was hanged by Hephaestus on the Seussian border. Now, Strobilos has been provisionally identified as Elbrus by some writers, uh, such as Douglas Freshfield in the exploration of the Caucasus in 1896. I mean, Elvis is the highest peak, it's the highest mountain in Europe, if you could call it Europe, um, and it's very, very high, and you can see it on a clear day from where people like Arian were. And Appian tells us that Pompey actually visited the Colchian Caucasus during the Mithridatic War, on purpose, to see the spot where Prometheus had been changed. Now, I do not believe that Pompey Magnus made it up to the top of Libras. I just don't. Now, ancient astronomers located the very arrow which Heracles had used against Prometheus' eagle, which forms the constellation Aquila, in the constant, sorry, it was small, the constellation Aquila, in the constellation Sagitta, or arrow, and it's pseudo hyginus who offers three alternative genealogies for this castasterized Caucasian eagle. He says it's either the child of Typhon and Echidna, or Gaia and Tartarus, which I think could be the East Galilean version, or the automaton of Hephaestus. So to skip forward, yes, I still have time, my other half. I'm going to skip forward a good 2,000 years to the first translations into modern languages of the East Galilean Prometheus found in the late 18th century. Now, those coincided with debates about the abolition of slavery, and that led to the identification of the eagle with plantation owners in numerous anti slavery political. Cartoons. Uh, this is a typical example, poems on the abolition of the slave trade, 1807. I've written extensively about this in a book called Ancient Slavery and Abolition, OUP, which, like all of my expensive books, is free on my website to download. This is completely illegal, but you don't get into trouble if you download them like Spotify, I do. Okay? And I've been waiting to be taken to court for 20 years. I started doing it because I got so many emails from very poor students in South America, Africa, and India saying we can't afford the book. I just made PDFs, put them up. No publisher has come after me. And I get many grateful emails. So if you want to read more, you can. But this is a very typical uh, cartoon of the time, although a serious one. You have Heracles with his bow, you have the dead eagle and you have a rather African-looking Prometheus. Now, there's a lot of problems here because it implies that the British, who were the first, actually, well, the French did it first, but then revoked it. The British were the first to abolish the slave trade in 1807. Uh, it implies that Hercules is a good British man. Prometheus had absolutely nothing to do 
with getting liberated himself. You know, there have been no uh, to say no to you know. And part six of William Blake's Visions of the Daughters of Albion in 1793 is an unusual response to the myth. An eagle's assault on a female rape victim, Uofuon, who's the benign personification of America and indigenous Americans, is usually understood as an allegorical representation of, amongst other things, American exploitation of its slaves. And this interpretation is particularly plausible given what Bromion, the thunder god, who's raped her in Blake's poem, says in the text close to this image. By soft American plains of mine, and mine by north and south, stamped with my signet of the swarthy children of the sun. They are obedient, they resist not, they obey the scourge. Their daughters worship terrors and obey the violence. Now, another political interpretation of the myth begins to get very, very varied, and the eagle can be a good guy or a bad guy. Um, and that is almost exactly the same time as the uh, cartoon I showed you. Napoleon, very early on, got identified with Prometheus when he was bringing the Promethean heat and the fire to Europe to end the ancient empires, the heroic side of uh, Prometheus as liberating rebel. But once imprisoned on Elba, there are many cartoons showing him as now the victim of the eagle. The British, of course, as they always do, particularly like to say that they had single-handedly defeated Napoleon. They also like to say they single-handedly defeated Hitler. They do. We only get the Battle of Britain movie. We never get Stalingrad. So Napoleon is, is very, very commonly in these things. Napoleon's admirers such as Goethe and the Italian poet Vincenzo Monto uh, were the ones who developed this most. But Byron takes up this idea of him as the victim of the eagle, and the eagle is a good guy. But then, let us go to Poland. And Emil Jean Arras Menez, the Polish Prometheus, out in the Bibliothèque Polonaise in Paris, which depicts the tumultuous war between Poland and Russia. And in this striking image, we see an allegorical representation of rebelliousness personified as a wounded soldier, Polish soldier, with bloody hands and torn uniform, he fiercely claws at his own chest while chained to a post. And the soldier's agony symbolizes the suffering endured by the Polish people during their struggle for independence from Russia. And the artist portrays Russia as an eagle feeding on the soldier's liver. And this metaphorical depiction highlights the oppressive nature of Russian rule over Poland during this period. And Venet's attention to detail is evident in every brush stroke, from the intricate chain of office on by the soldier the wounds, and it really emphasises the brutality and devastation caused by war. And in my remaining, yes, ten? Do I still have ten minutes? Yeah. I'm just going to talk you through. You have in total fourteen minutes. Oh wow. Okay. Um, first lesson I always teach all my PhD students is never ever run over more is always less. So, let's just go through one. This is one of my favourites, uh, where Karl Marx's Rheinische Zeitung was censored. Uh, he came up with this idea. He was very, very fond of Eskalus. There are a lot of briefly references. Uh, what I like about this is that the artist, he shuffled to his printing press with the uh, eagle of censorship, stopping him print what he wanted, what he wants to. But this person knows that Eskalus and knows that the chorus of the Eastphalian Prometheus is the chorus of Oceanids. Now, if you're on the Rhine, what's the equivalent of an Oceanid? It is always on. It is obviously a chorus of Rhine maidens. So, the Rhine maidens are lamenting the censorship of the Rhine Zeitung, which meant that Karl Marx fairly soon after that 
bumped off to London and wrote the comedy's manifesto. I think this is maybe my favourite. I'll go back to the slavery theme. So the brilliance here, this is the anti-slavery almanac for 1844, so slavery has actually been abolished in Britain, not just slave trade, but slavery in 1832. And, even, and after five or six years, I mean, it took a very long time for the slaves actually to get properly liberated, but they had been, and they were all now fleeing to England, mainly um, when escaped slaves gathered, especially in Leeds. And the anti slavery armor, this is so clever because it takes the American eagle, which is an eagle, off the top of a capital, and we have a female Prometheus defending her baby. Very, very clever merging. And again, the eagle is the bad guy, it's the pro slavers in the American government before the American Civil War. Uh, but this is just to show the multi valence of this image. Punch cartoon, this is 1861, so just as the Great War uh, in America, the Civil War, and the you know, slavery is, a, is going to get abolished very soon. Here is King Cotton. So King Cotton is the representative of the Confederates who wanted to hang on to slavery. And in 1861, the Union managed to blockade all the Confederate ports. So here we actually have the American eagle, the eagle uh, of, of, the, of the Republic, devouring beginning successfully to devour the cotton traders. So this is exactly the other way around from that one. Good guy, bad guy, good eagle, bad eagle. You can find in your own national press easily a Prometheus, I think, all over the world. Most people won't know it's the Caucasus, that you, but you can start telling people that. Right? Uh, this is a very powerful, I think it must be 1970, but I couldn't find a date. And I used Google Translate because my Russian isn't up so much. Actually, no, my husband used Google Translate. <laughs> um, so, a white god predator tears the bodies of workers and peasants. This is a riff on the standard iconography of Prometheus, the Vibringer, as symbol of socialism. But here, uh, the Red Army is being uh, attacked. Wounded Red Army member is being attacked by the uh, White Guard as the eagle. And this is, let's go into ethics, not politics. This is a Christian cartoon from 1928 where uh, the body is, is an ordinary human uh, and he's chained up with various different vices like selfishness um, and the eagle that is coming for him on the Caucasus is the worst of all for this particular Christian cartoonist, which is desire, right? That's the one that's going to really eat away at the Christian Prometheus. <laughs> Daily Telegraph, but this is Richard Nixon, and in fact, he seems to have both a vulture and an eagle. The vulture was uh, uh, started in, in Roman poetry. I can't find it anywhere in Greek. The Romans may not have understood the Greek for bird of prey. And you start sometimes to get vultures and things like Marshall. But I like this, which Nixon uh, is, is, is being tied up just as all the news uh, broke and Watergate has attacked him, but the eagle is coming in. In fact, a whole flock of them to represent all the journalists who were after him. So there the eagle's a good guy attacking the corrupt president. Do you like my really complex ethics, don't you? He's a good guy, bad guy. <laughs> and near the end now, I'm particularly fond of this one because Charles Clark really was all but met. That's not true. I was about to say he was single-handedly responsible for the fall of the Labour government after all those years, but he had a terrible year. He was a cabinet minister and every single day there was a new scandal attached to him. It became a national joke and I'm afraid he had such a distinctive appearance, which I won't go into because it's body shaming or whatever, 
but he has such a distinctive appearance that cartoonists love him. And there's something about that distinctive appearance on somebody who's been trained to a rock in the Caucasus for however many thousand years. Um, and that's the evil of scandal latest, definitely a vulture. I'm sure you will be able to find these in your own press, definitely in Greece. Definitely in Greece. Um, now, online fact and fiction is something that is beginning to be studied. A very eminent classicist in Poland called Katarzyna Marciniak um, has done a wonderful set of books on children's literature and uh, a long ERC project. She's written an article about fan fiction. Fan fiction is where fans on say TV series online write new episodes. And I wish I knew who on earth wrote this. Now, Warehouse 13 was a, a, a rather silly sci-fi plot about a bunch of uh, sort of heroes, superheroes who are sort of going to save the world from various futuristic problems. And um, this is a fan fiction. Somebody knows that really obscure source hygienist and the automaton, right? The Caucasian Eagle was collected by Warehouse One, because of all these different warehouses, managed to escape when excess energy managed to activate it, making its seek way across the world to be mistaken for and perhaps even inspired various giant birds of myth, whoever rocks is the bird are, anyway, which eventually settled in the Himalayas. This person knows the Hindu Kush tradition, right? A very erudite person writing fan fiction. Um, and it was re recaptured in 2014. So I would love this episode to be made. This was the design that whoever wrote this little story has made, and that was really quite a magnificent uh, automaton. And I'm going to leave you on this because I have no words. 1920s. If you're French and you drink too much, you need a liver potion. The one on the right is just about okay. The one on the left appears to me to imply rather too much that. Prometheus is thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> Thank you.